Welcome back to Let's Talk Careers. My name is Miss V, and I'm so excited to bring another incredible guest. Today, we are zooming around the world to Prince Edward Island in my home country, Canada, where we meet with Devin Turcott, who is a career advisor and the owner of Careerified. Welcome, Devin. It's so great to have you with me today. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Super, super excited. I mean, I love all things careers. When I came across your profile, you call it careerified. I'm like, that is an incredible title for a company that deals with career development. I know that we have a lot uh, in alignment. You work to help Gen Z and young millennials. So there's so much that we want to dive into. But before we do that, I thought we could take you on a little journey back to when you were a teenager and Mm -hmm. to learn about how you connect the dots to where it started, how you got inspired on that career, and how it led you to where we are right now. Um, so when I was a teenager, uh, I remember applying for a lot of psychology um, degree programs as I was finishing up high school. That was an area I was very interested in. Um, what sort of ended up changing my mind is I was interested, but I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And the school I ended up attending, I didn't get into the co-op program. And I'd been hoping to use the co-op to be able to um, check out different kinds of options for work. And because I wasn't really sure, I started actually taking a lot of different types of classes in many different disciplines to get a sense of what I wanted. I was very interested in environmental issues as well. And so I ended up studying geography for my undergrad. And then I went on to do some graduate studies in environmental management. So I actually started my career working in environmental consulting, which is totally not even related <laughs> to what I'm doing now. Um, and I, my first grown-up job was with a, a small company in my hometown, and they were terrific, actually. It was a great place to work. Um, it was really nice to be in a small business, I think, because there was higher touch to it. Um, I got a lot of mentorship and a lot of coaching, which we didn't really talk about coaching in those days, but that's really what was going on, which was really amazing as a first job experience. Um, But ultimately I didn't like the work. So I went back to school for communications and my intention was to stay in the career, sorry, to stay in the environmental field, but kind of shift into more of a public relations or um, maybe like a public stewardship outreach sort of capacity. But what ended up happening is I saw a job posting for a nonprofit that promoted careers in the trades to students. And I grew up in a family that is full of skilled trades people. I have a huge soft spot for the trades. And um, my dad in particular had passed away just a few years before. He was a pipe fitter by trade. And I thought, you know, I think I'd be interested in trying that out. And that kind of set me down the path to working in more of a career education and ultimately a career coaching advisory um, role. I was with a company was called Skills Ontario. I was with them for about six years doing in-school presentations, working with um, students on what's a trade, what's an apprenticeship, how do you get started? And then uh, I shifted into the community college sector in the province of Ontario, where I was living at the time. And I worked at um, at one of the colleges around Toronto as a recruiter first, and then I moved into the career center. Um, and really starting right when I was at Skills, I was hearing a lot of very weird myths and perspectives and things that I think we all thought were normal when we were kids, like you have to go to university to be successful or, um, um, you know, that it's it's straightforward and easy to make a living at any number of different things. Um, And I kept thinking, why is it that we pervade on these myths? We keep thinking that this stuff is true. It's not true. And by the time, you know, you reach a grown up age and you're a parent, you know, it's not true. Like, I'm pretty sure they're not hearing it from their parents. And yet all of these myths persist. And Eventually, a time came where we had a situation in one of the universities here in Canada, where um, over the course of about five months, four students died by suicide. And it sent shockwaves through all of the post-secondary institutions in Canada because it was a huge wake-up call. 
And what really got me is we, we beefed up mental health supports. Lots of people got, you know, mental health first aid and suicide prevention training and all of those things were wonderful. But when I watched the original news story, there was one student in particular who said, you know, all this counseling and mental health stuff is great. But when you have pressure to get 90s and everything, it's really not going to be that effective. And I thought, why do you have pressure to get 90s and everything? Again, one of those myths of like, you have to be the super high performer in order to get anywhere in your career. And that's the first time I started thinking, I would love to have a business where I start changing those perceptions before people get there. And that's where like the seed of career, if I was planted, it was still a few years <laughs> before I launched it. Um, but that's where that came from. So that's how I landed where I am today. Listening to you tell the story for me, it just sounds amazing. And it sounds to me like you, you adapted to changes, you adapted to the environment, and you also took the call when situations were rising in your life. Now, I know in our Canadian system that young people are almost generalists when they're at high school. They get to take all these different classes. And then depending on your province, some might attend university a year later. Some might go a little bit earlier, do pre-university, what we call CJEP. But in other parts of the world, students are choosing subjects as young as 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And it kind of it funnels them down to specific subjects. And I think that fear comes in. As a professional now in the work that you do, how do you help Gen Z in choosing that career? Because like you were saying about that pressure to get those 90s, I think I don't think it's so much a myth as an unspoken assumption that, you know, when we look at social media, everybody that's promoting themselves is uber amazing at everything they do. And even a young person watching this podcast right now, they might be looking at this and thinking, Devin has totally got it all put together. She's got a company. She knows what she's doing. Maria, the same. But they don't see that journey towards, right? And I think that sometimes that can almost be the challenge. So how do you help those young people that feel that pressure, but also are looking around them and thinking everybody else has it put together. I'm so young. I don't know how to do this, but I can't ask anybody because I'm too afraid to get it wrong. Yeah, it, that's a major barrier for a lot of people. Um, I can tell you a million percent. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I know what I want things to be like, and I know how I envision things, um, but I definitely don't have it all put together. And I think, I think it's a very long time on the human journey before you realize that having it all together is a myth. That's not a real thing. Most people don't have it all together. Um, even if you are, you know, you're established in your career, you have a family, you have a home, all these things that, you know, are sort of hallmarks of success in our societies that doesn't mean that you have it all together. And that's a very difficult thing to wrap your head around when you don't have a lot of life experience and you don't have a lot of work experience, because it seems like there's supposed to be this point where you arrive. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's a lot of broadening the perspective. Um, so I do a lot of when we're talking career exploration, I mean, we'll do a few career assessments. I always do more than one because I want the people I work with to understand that just because, you know, this assessment says you're this number or letter or color or whatever it is that it says about you, that's not the only thing that you are. You are also this, you are also this, you are also this. So starting with broadening that perspective on how you even define yourself and then moving that into, uh, especially when you do a lot of career assessments, you're going to get a list of 20, 30, 40 careers that potentially match. Are they all going to be interesting to you? No. Um, but it's just breaking open that shell and saying, you know, it's not just one thing that you're destined to do forever. There are a lot of things that could fit depending on your perspective. And then I bring in things like, let's look at trends in industries. You know, like we pull up, I mean, it's not the most fascinating stuff in the world. Usually the students, parents are like, wait a second, what? Mm -hmm. Students don't find it super interesting, but it's, it's enough to say, you know, what's actually happening in the world around you and how can you participate in that? 
in the way that you participate? What can you bring to, you know, okay, we're expanding whatever it means, let's say oil and gas exploration, and you're interested in graphic design, how could you put those two things together Mm. and sort of kind of breaking some of the pictures they already have and helping them to create new ones. I find a big one um, that people say when, when students are, you know, stuff like follow your passion or you can do anything. And I feel like so often those are very challenging statements because they're too big. You know, it's like handing somebody a blank piece of paper and saying, well, you can draw anything, anything you want. It doesn't draw anything. And it's when you're looking at a blank piece of paper, that's not helpful. But if I was to put a few squiggles on that piece of paper to get you started, you could branch out from there. Um, So I think a lot of it is just putting a few squiggles down for people so that they can start putting some definition into what that looks like for them instead of handing them a blank piece of paper. So if I was a parent watching this right now, listening to your tips and thinking, that sounds really great, Devin, but we don't have that much time. Our children are at school a lot. They don't have time. They don't, you know, some institutions might not have any career development. Others might associate career development with, you know, university applications and still others might kind of get it wrong. Because I think sometimes as a practitioner, you're either repairing the damage that was done by a practitioner before you, or you're striving to rise to that level of excellence. And at the same time, you're educating community and parents because they're constantly going back to how it was when they were younger. Now, I know that you're in Canada and the context might be slightly different in different parts of the world, but if a parent were watching this right now and thinking, Devin, that sounds great. How do we do this? Where do we start as parents if we, A, can't afford to to pay someone to do this, or B, we just kind of want to learn how to do it ourselves? What are some of your tips? One thing I, particularly in the pandemic, have found myself talking about more is taking a gap year. I'm a big fan of a gap year. Um, I know here what we find is um, across the country in many provinces and territories, students will take some kind of course um, in their grade 10 year in high school, uh, which may be their first or second year of high school, depending which province or territory you're in. And it's usually something called career studies or career foundations or something along those lines. And it's hit or miss how useful it is. And then Nobody really talks about career stuff again until the year before they graduate high school and they do have to start applying to wherever they're going to next if they have plans to do that. And it always feels then like this crunch happens. You know, they've been in school for two weeks of their final year of high school and recruiters from local colleges and universities are showing up. There's a big post-secondary fair being hosted by the guidance department. Um, They're getting email newsletters from the school saying, hey, make sure you're doing this, make sure you're doing that. And so it does feel like this very small, crunchy space. So I think there are a couple of ways to stretch it out. And a gap year is one of them. So take some time after that secondary school period to do more research. Um, I know it's very challenging for students because they have that feeling of, but everybody else is going on and I'm going to get left behind. And for parents, it's challenging in your own social circles to say, well, my, my kid's taking a gap year where other people are like, my child is studying engineering or they're going to be a doctor, you know, and it's, it can be socially that pressure can be there. But I think when you look at the outcomes and the potential outcomes, there's a lot of value in hitting the brakes and slowing right down. And then the other thing is to start earlier. Don't wait until the last year of high school to start exploring this stuff and start gathering little bits of information, right? If you do it in little pieces at a time, it's not going to feel like this, you know, boulder you're trying to push up a hill. It's, uh, you know, it's going to be a slow collection of information. And whether that means you tour campuses before you get to your final year of high school, or you're doing informational interviews with people in various types of work, whatever that looks like, there are a lot of ways to get good career information without feeling the crunch. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Let's go into your top three tips. You say at number one, talk to people doing the work and find out what they like and don't like and what they found to be unexpected about work. 
I love that. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing right now. One of the challenges that I see when I speak with young people and we bring professionals to their bubble, they don't know what to ask. They don't know how to engage in that conversation. I think that's another assumption that we have in education is that our students are not only career ready, but also ready to network. And being able to talk to people is a whole different basket of of skills and how do you suggest that a young person learn how to gain the confidence to talk to people and know what to ask them without feeling so into themselves because that's pretty much what goes on when we're when we're young right we're worried about well will they think i'm saying the right thing will i sound right will i sound silly so what are some of your tips around that number one career tip um i'm in terms of what to ask a really simple, good old fashioned Google search. What can I ask in an information interview? What kinds of things should I know about a career before I go into it? And it'll at least give you some ideas of maybe typical questions. And as you start talking to people, you'll find that themes come up or patterns come up or things are being said over and over that you want to dig into more. So what to ask don't put too much pressure on yourself. Three or four questions. Don't make it too outrageous. Um, it's definitely something where we can get very in our heads about, oh, I have to have a formal meeting and I have to come across as very smart and fancy and impressive. You just need to ask a few questions, especially as a kid, you get, you know, a teenager, you get the advantage of you're a kid. So you can, you can play that a little bit. You don't have to be a polished, fancy grown up, which is nice. Um, in terms of who to ask, I always say start close to home. You don't have to start by, you know, getting on LinkedIn and setting up the perfect profile and reaching out to this, you know, to the Gary V's and the Ariana Huffingtons of the world to like ask them about their careers. Start with people, you know, you know, talk to friends of your parents or colleagues of your parents, talk to your neighbors, extended family members, um, your friends, parents, or older siblings, if they're, um, you know, they're already in post-secondary or they're, they've already started in work. Start close to home and ask general questions about what do you do? What got you interested? What would you change about your work if you could? And you'll start to build that confidence muscle where eventually you will reach a point where you randomly connect with somebody on LinkedIn and say, hey, can I ask you a few questions about your career? But you don't just start there. Start close to home. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now, your top number two tip is if you're specifically interested in business ownership, Find out what kind of help is available in terms of financing, coaching, support, and workshops. I mean, being an entrepreneur, that's like a whole new ball game, completely new ball game. And I think right now what I'm seeing is this trend of encouraging youth to go into entrepreneurship. I definitely think it has a lot to do with the rising youth unemployment and also because young people want to feel really connected to the purpose of what they're doing at work. However, in saying that, as you mentioned, the Gary V's of the world, they have it all put together on that social platform. And I think sometimes the idea of entrepreneurship and anyone who's taken the train of being an entrepreneur knows that it doesn't look like, or it doesn't, it doesn't start the way it kind of looks like. So how do you help a young person who's like, I want to own my own business where do I get started putting financing to the side? Because yeah, definitely you need that financing, but we have to start with an idea. So how, how do you help them in building their vision for what they want to be doing as an entrepreneur? A big part of it is what sort of impact do you want to have? You know, start with the end. If you could change something, what would you change? If you could have uh, an ideal outcome in whatever area you're interested in, what would that look like? And then um, similar to the information interviews, you know, start with local business owners, you know, and start with business owners that you know, right? If you regularly see people like a dentist, a doctor, you know, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. And we don't, we don't think about that in those mm. kinds of terms. But these are people that you probably know and have known for many years. They don't have to be doing the same thing that you're doing. But there are some things that are the same across the board in terms of business. Um, certainly here across the country, there's a lot of interest in sort of youth entrepreneurship, 
So there are certainly programs out there you can get involved with that are reasonably low cost, sometimes free to get involved with. So look for things like that um, or any sort of a uh, small business center. Um, what I'm thinking is stuff like chambers of commerce or boards of trade, where they often, a lot of their membership is small businesses and they support um, usually the small business community around them. Do they have tools or resources to help you get started? Um, and start with some of those things and you'll you'll begin to see what's important and what isn't. The one thing I do find the second I feel like I said, I'd like to start a business. Suddenly, like my Instagram and my Facebook feeds were full of ads of all these like different kinds of business coaches and stuff. So the overwhelm can be real for sure. So I always think it's just, it's best to start where your feet are, start in your own community, start in a place that you know, to get that information on what you can be doing and and what will be most impactful. And then you say, tell everybody what you want to do as your number top three tip for a teenager. That's like, what are you talking about, Devin? I not only have to do it, but I have to let everybody know what if I'm not successful? How do you go about encouraging those younger people to gain the courage? And I think, you know, millennials will have that same challenge as well as Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it, but do I really have to tell people that I'm taking the leap? So what are your tips around that? There's a really, I I don't know the exact quote, um, but a really great mindset to put in this is you're going to face rejection, but the first person who rejects you should not be you. Mm. And as soon as I read that, I went, oh my gosh, I do that all the time. Mm. Um, I absolutely have a tendency to think, oh, people aren't going to want to help me. Why would they want to help me? You'd be surprised (laughs) at who wants to help you. And you don't want to be the person making that decision for them. Um, So similarly, when you start with people, you know, you're a lot more likely to get buy in. Um, I've had a few situations where I'm working with clients and they're trying to do it doesn't even have to be starting a business. They're trying to do a job search. And one of my standard questions is, who have you told that you're looking for a job? Um, And, you know, it's, oh, you know, well, I mean, my, my mom knows I'm looking or my friends know I'm looking or my wife knows I'm looking, depending who I'm talking to. Um, And I say, okay, but who else? That's it. They've only ever told one person. You'd be really surprised at how interconnected people are in your life. Um, And so when you start telling extended family members, your friends, your teachers, uh, your neighbors, I'm looking for a summer job. I'm not totally sure, but I know I'm pretty good at A and B. You might be surprised at the suggestions they come out with. They will start looking on your behalf. They will have an ear out for you. Um, for what's happening out there. Similar if you're starting a business. Um, I recently launched a pilot program and in order to get it started, it was for parents and teens um, looking at how to plan for post-secondary, how to plan for careers effectively. And I started by contacting all the people I know who have teenagers. And some of them were like friends from high school I hadn't talked to in 20 plus years, but I shot them a quick Facebook message and said, hey, might be a long shot, but like, I'm trying to create a program. You have kids about this age. Could I ask you a few questions? And immediately the answer was absolutely, of course. So I had to get over that myself, (laughs) that headspace of, you know, oh, people aren't going to want to help me. Sure they are. You know, you have people in your life who care about you. That's who you want to start with. Um, But let them know what it is you're trying to do. It's not a question of whether or not it's successful tell them what your aims are and your goals are. And people will say, huh, I'd love to help you out with that. Probably a lot more often than you think. Amazing. Oh my goodness. I could keep going on forever. I'm so conscious of our time together. Devin, just before we're walking away for a young person thinking that was a lot of information. What do you want them to remember about everything that you've talked about? That That's a hard question, but kind of like what trailer version of everything that you have learned and gained in helping young people what's that nugget that you think if you remember this i know that you'll get started in that great way i want you to i think it's just to be as honest as you can with yourself and the people around you about what you would like to be doing you don't have to have a clear definition but the more you talk about it 
the easier it will be to articulate and the clearer those goals and those visions will become for you. You don't have to keep it all to yourself. So whether it's information interviews or it's talking to local business owners about being an entrepreneur or it's telling your grandmother what kind of job you're looking for, you have a community and you should be able to tap into it. They would be happy to help you and help you define that. You don't have to carry it by yourself. Amazing. Thank you so much, Devin, for being here and, and taking time to be with us. And that brings us right to the end. Another incredible conversation. It's all things careers. We were speaking with Devin Turcott, who is a career advisor and the owner of Careerified. Thank you for watching and we will see you at our next Let's Talk Careers with Miss V.